Okay, so this is the beginning of the live chat for Philosophy 172. I will be available for an hour to talk about anything. We'll talk about, say, what's coming ahead in the lectures, the assignments, in schoolwork, um, say, just uh, how we can apply these things to real-world situations, talk about the textbook, we'll talk about the readings, anything you'd like. Say, this is this is me trying to make myself available uh, in a kind of way where if we were in a much better situation, I could I could uh, just do one-on-one -on -one with you in a classroom or somewhere on campus. Okay, so I'm going to keep this going for an hour, whoever shows up. If anyone uh, shows up in the chat, please do say hello. I see we have, we have uh, one participant. I'm still not sure whether that's myself. We seem to be having a better internet connection today, so hopefully that lasts through the chat. Okay, a little sip of water. Okay, so let's see who shows up. Let's see if anyone shows up. Looks like we've got a couple of people. Any anyone from uh, Philosophy One Seventy Two from Critical Thinking and Writing? Please do say hello. Remember, this is how you can get. Participation points, They're the only extra credit that I give for the course. Okay. Hello there. Hello. I'm, I'm sorry I don't read uh, the, uh, the Korean language. So who, who are we talking to here? Who, uh, who are you? I wish I could read your name. Aha. It's Yung Jung Kim. Thank you so much for showing up, Yung Jung. All right, how are you doing today? Very good. I'm glad you're doing good, Yunjo. Say, what other courses are you enrolled in right now? Are you taking anything else besides critical thinking and writing? Ah, you have Java C and math. All right, we also have uh, Sara in here, Sara Baker, uh, say here from Philosophy 172. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, would you pronounce it Sara? It's a, you know, uh, say it says it's Cameron Baker, but we prefer Sara. Am I pronouncing it correctly? Sara. Please let me know if I'm if I'm doing it right. And are you a uh, a computing major, Yung Jung? And. Uh, Aha, you're a CS major. All right, Zara. All right, like the word Zara. Well, the, the, the thing is, like, the uh, say, the word Zar, as in the Zar of Russia, it's a t -t 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 kind of sound. It's not a Z sound, it's a t -t 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 sound. Mom came up with it cheating at Scrabble. Okay, all right, very good. So that's what you... Like to go by, and I will do it with a Z. I'll do Zara. Okay. And uh, just just tell your mom it's not Czar of Russia; it's Tsar of Russia. And uh, Yu Jung, do you have um, you have many more courses to go through before uh, you can get out of Fullerton College? Say I I ask because oftentimes mine uh, my critical thinking and writing course is the last course people have to do before they matriculate out of here into the university. Enzo, Enzo, hello. Hello, welcome to the chat. Uh, we are introducing ourselves right now. Aha, uh -huh, yes, you need to say, uh, uh, Yu Jung says he needs to finish some more science courses. Okay, so once once you do that, Yu Jung, do you, uh, do you have an idea where you would like to go? Uh, to Cal State Fullerton, Long Beach, Irvine, anywhere else? Okay. 
And so what we're doing, Enzo and, and Zara, is we're introducing ourselves. Uh, let me let me know what other courses you're taking. Han, hello there, Han. I remember you from, from the other chat. Say, <laughs> Okay, uh, Cal Poly or UCI. All right, Zara is taking Calculus 3, Organic Chemistry, General Physics, and this class. My goodness, Zara. That is quite a load, quite a course load. Okay, all right, Han says, call me Jane. Very good, Jane. I will call you Jane. You're welcome. All right, that is quite a course for load, Zara. Are you a um, are you a science major? Like um, uh, like Yunjung, are you uh, looking to go uh, to a uh, uh, to a school that's got a good science program, like Cal Poly or UCI? Say, and if we were if we were doing uh, a chemistry major, beautiful, Zara. If we were doing our our class as we would normally do it, you know, in a one-on-one -on -one classroom. On the first day, I would have every student introduce themselves and tell me something about themselves and also also tell me what their major is if they are declared major. Uh, this is a way for me to get you know get to know you better. Oh, okay. So it's, hello there. Hello there. Uh uh Hun? Seong Seong Hyun. Is that how it's pronounced? Seong Hyun? I, I apologize. I am a terrible, terrible white person. I do very, very, very bad with, uh, with names that are from, from cultures that I'm not yet familiar with. Uh, I'm, I'm trying my best, but thank you. Seong Hyun. Seong Hyun. Seong Hyun. I, I will work on it. I will work on it. I'll do my best, but thank you very much for the thumbs up. So what we're doing our, right now is introducing ourselves, tell, telling each other what other classes we're taking, uh, if we have declared majors, if we're almost ready to get out of Fulton College, if you have many more classes to do, you know, it's something where I can get you to know you better as as one of the students in the course, and also for the other students to get to know each other better. So uh, hopefully we'll be able to get some some uh, some more people uh, doing that in here. We already have some lovely people. We got Jane. We got Zara. Uh, we got Yunjun, we got uh, Siang Hyun, and uh, and a few others. Oh, Siang Hyun is is your younger brother. You are you are siblings. Oh, oh, great. So we've got the whole family in here. Oh, that's right. Enzo is here too. Uh, Enzo is doing math, government, and PE, and you are a math major. Let me know. Let me know this, Enzo. How are you doing your PE courses remotely? Uh, is it you um, that you're all uh, uh, online at the same time and the PE instructor is, is telling you what to do while you're in your room, in your, wherever your computer are? Oh, pardon me, I gotta blow my nose. <laughs> gotta make sure I can get all that mucus out of my mustache. Okay. Oh, it's a stress management course. Okay, well, that's that's a very useful course to have right now. Oh, boy. Absolutely. We all, we all need some stress management right now. Um, a lot of our nerves can become pretty easily frayed under lockdown. All right, Zara said, did your internship at UC Berkeley, ooh, and you did it remotely because of COVID, for nine weeks of summer in a chemical biology class, so I'm thinking of, to change to that. Wow, you see Berkeley. Well, wow, that is a that is a prestigious school for a chemical biology lab. That would be pretty neat. That'd be pretty neat. Uh, had I um, looking back on things, uh, if I had not gone into philosophy, I think I would have liked to have gone into the sciences. I think I would like to have become a marine biologist and specialize in cephalopods because I love squids and octopuses. Yeah, that would that would be pretty neat. But so my my hat goes off to anyone who uh, who works in the in the sciences. Um, one reason why I think I might have just enjoyed the experience better than going into philosophy is that philosophy you are pretty much just trained to work on your own. You come together sometimes for conferences. You deliver papers in front of each other, but you really don't learn how to work together. In the sciences, there's a lot of ways in which you have to learn how to work 
with each other. And so there's a, there's a, there's a, a wonderful atmosphere of participation and collaboration like there isn't in philosophy, I'm sad to say. All right. All right. So Enzo's doing stress management. Zara's doing a lot of science work, uh, as well as Yung Jung. So we have we have um, got a fair amount of science stuff going on. Uh, and Enzo, Enzo is a math major. My goodness me. Well, I'd say this is uh, what we are doing is kind of a course in logic. And one of the things that I hope that we'll do is uh, some, some, some formal logic work in this. This is not a, a formal logic class. I, t I sometimes teach formal logic, but this is a class in uh, what they call informal logic. So it's not just concerned about, say, the form of the logical structure, but say, this, say the, uh, uh, the context of this application, say the particular kinds of words we're using, say whether they're vague or ambiguous, say the, uh, the, the meaning of the truth value, and so on. But uh, hopefully, hopefully we'll get into some of the nitty gritty of the formal aspects, and that might have some appeal to you in your uh, training in mathematics. Uh, presenting at the uh, SACNAS conference on my research I did this summer next month. And what is SACNAS? Zara, Let's see here. I'm trying to. I'm trying to see if I can figure out the acronym from the letters. I'm guessing. Uh, I'm guessing science and chemistry might be amongst the S's and the C, but uh, let us know what that is. So I hope. I hope we're able to offer, say, uh, a lot in this class, depending upon uh, whatever your interest or your specialization is. Uh, it is kind of class that is going to touch on most of things that we deal with in philosophy and a lot of things we don't normally deal with, particularly how we can practically apply the tools and techniques that we can gain from this class to problems that are not necessarily philosophy problems. Like, you know, how if I wanted to present, say, a new business strategy to my boss, what would be, say, an effective way of doing that? Say, that's one of the things I wanted to touch on this class. Just, and also, you know, if you were in a, a city council meeting and you were very concerned with how the budget was being spent and you wanted to show, say, why it is being mismanaged, I hope to show you how you might be able to do something like that. Society for Advancement of Chicanos, Hispanics, and Native Americans in Science. Okay, well, I was wrong about the chemistry part, uh, but that is, that is wonderful news uh, that there is a society like that. And uh, are, you, um, are you of, of Native American uh, heritage at all? Uh, just, just, just out of curiosity. Um, and I'm, that's wonderful. I, uh, when, when, is, when, is that, uh, when is that conference presenting? Is that coming up? See, I... I, I uh, I had a number of conferences I was going to be doing this year myself until COVID happened. I was, uh, I was even set to do a conference in France back in, ooh, when was it? It was back in March. Um, but say the, the, whole, the whole planet went on lockdown at that time. Yeah. So I missed miss my chance to go back to France, so to speak. But what, what was I getting to? I was... Uh, I was going to say that, say, that we're going to be trying to offer a good deal for this course on how to utilize, say, what we're going to learn about, say, argument structure, argument criticism, argument presentation, um, say, how to, how to present to a certain kind of audience, and how to, how to sort of constructively respond to someone giving a bad argument. And so we're, it's, it's, going, it's going to have a lot of things that are going to touch into not only, uh, not only in logic and in philosophy, but also in psychology. Uh, we're going to be talking about cognitive biases in this class. Why is it that sometimes it's not enough to present an effective argument? We have to understand, say, why someone might not accept it 
even if there is nothing wrong with our data and nothing wrong with the structure of our argument because their unwillingness to accept it or to see the merit of your case might have nothing to do with the merit of the case that you're presenting or how well you presented it. It might have to do with uh, a certain kind of prejudice or it might have something to do with uh, just emotionally where they are coming from. Okay, so Zara says it's open to anyone, but yes, I uh, am from uh, biological, the biological side of your father uh, says that you, uh, oh, okay, actually, I'm, I'm going to be doing that, uh, that test myself pretty soon. My mother got me that test, that 23andMe test, and she's been, she's been, she's been insisting, let's use that word, she's been insisting that I take it for about six months now. So I think it's about time that I take it. Okay, so it's happening later in October, October 22nd. Ooh, close to Halloween. Okay, uh, let's say, I think that's marvelous, say that you're, how well you um, you are involved in this. I got the Travel Scholarship too. Last year, it took place in Hawaii. This year was supposed to take place in Long Beach, but it's online now. Yes, we can. Yep, that's that's the way things are right now, and I hope I hope that we'll be able to discuss discuss the pandemic a good deal in our class, because I don't need to tell you that there is a great deal of misinformation going on right now, and some of it may be deliberately sent out there. There might be a lot of deliberately uh, say, say deliberately cons uh, cons um, uh, deliberate fabrications when it comes to say what kind of uh, what kind of information, what kind of uh, data that we can get of what's going on. Uh, one thing I encountered recently was the claim that the amount of COVID nineteen deaths have been inflated. That they said, well, go go to the CDC site. You can see that only. 6% of the people who had COVID-19 actually died of COVID-19. Now, before I give the game away, say, let me know if, if you've already run into people saying things like that already. Let me know if you've heard people say things like the numbers are inflated or it's not as bad as people are saying. And, and let me know if they also say, well, go, go to the CDC site. And it clearly says that only 6% of people with COVID-19 had died of COVID-19. And I'll tell you, I'll tell you why they're they're wrong in that claim in a second. But let's see if anyone else has encountered that yet. Or if you've already heard someone making a a uh, uh, a a an infactual claim about the pandemic. Let me let me know what the what the context was, what the situation was. Up up until up until the end of the last semester, I still had students who believed that the virus was created in a lab in China. It was not created in a lab in China, but they believed that because that was the only information they heard. The only thing they heard was, well, it was created in a Chinese lab, which is not true, as far as we know. But because, say, this rumor had been spreading around, this became the source of their information. They had, uh, say, these students had no political agenda in believing this information as opposed to another bit of information. You know, the, 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 one, the one that is uh, that is more universally accepted, that it was, say, just a you know, mutation, as happens naturally, is a naturally occurring uh, thing. And, and that uh, just because this, this bit of misinformation out, was out there about where the virus came from, they took it as a matter of fact. So I explained to them, say, why, why they need to be careful with this when they hear claims like this, how to check up on them. It's actually pretty easy to find out whether you're dealing... Excuse me. That's a thing on my tongue. It's actually pretty easy to find out whether you're dealing with something that is just a rumor or a conspiracy theory or something that seems legit. 
There are very easy ways of doing that because uh, there are all kinds of conspiracy theories going on now. All right, what's Zara saying? Uh, 23 even co uh, connected my mom to a biological family 50 years later, and they have been wondering what happened to her the whole time. So it definitely can lead to interesting results. Well, very good. Very good. <laughs> Uh, I actually had no idea that it was that it had been going on for so long. So that's pretty interesting. So over, uh, say, 50 years at the very least. That's very cool. All right. So I guess I need to check up on, on my heritage. I, I already have a pretty good idea of my heritage. Pretty much everyone in my family has taken this thing except me. So I, I, I have a pretty good idea what my, my heritage background is. I am mostly Irish. Um, I'm Jewish on my dad's side and Ukrainian and Mongolian on my mother's side. So, uh, if you're a, if you have Native American out, uh, heritage out there, I am, um, I'm kind of your cousin thanks to my Mongolian heritage. Cause you know, we, we would be, we would be related, uh, to the people who went over the land bridge thousands and thousands and thousands of years ago. Okay. So, all right. So here's the thing about the claim that only six percent of deaths are due to COVID-19. So here's here's how they're misreading it. Here's how they're misreading that information. The thing is, and many of you already know this, COVID-19 is something that if you already have a condition, if you already have high blood pressure or diabetes or you have difficulty breathing, that it's going to make your situation worse because it is going to really, really severely affect your immune system is going to really severely affect the your overall ability to deal with whatever your condition is. So it you know it 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 really 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 limits the way that your body can can effectively fight things off. So if you if you already have something and then you get COVID-19, that COVID-19 is going to make your current situation more dangerous. So the 6% that they have on the CDC site, on the Center for Disease Control site, is only about people who died of COVID-19 exclusively. But the other 94% of people who have died from it have died from complications brought on by the COVID-19 due to a pre-existing condition. So these are people who had a heart condition already, or had high blood pressure, had diabetes, had asthma, had some sort of uh, autoimmune deficiency, something like that. Something like that already. They get COVID-19. The COVID-19 exacerbates their current condition. So then, then they they'll uh, they'll uh, uh, they they'll die to something both asthma related and COVID related. So the, the reason why people are confused when they say only 6% of the people who they say have died of COVID-19 have actually died of COVID-19, the confusion is they think that it's either one thing or the other. Either you die from COVID-19 or you die from something else. That is a fallacy. Remember, we said a fallacy is a mistake in reasoning. The mistake in reasoning is, is thinking that when it comes to these situations, it has to be either one thing or the other, that it couldn't be an alternative that is a mixture of the two. And that's what we're dealing with right here. We're not dealing with people who have died of asthma instead of COVID-19. We're dealing with people who have died of COVID-19 and asthma, that both of them are together. Both of them are contributories to the cause of death. You can't just say, well, this person had asthma and they also had COVID-19, but it was probably the asthma that killed them. No, it was the COVID-19 that worsened their condition because, you know, and they, they can they can say whether whether it was so severe or not to list it as a cause of death. So when you hear people say that the numbers are inflated, tell them that the numbers might actually be undervalued. We might actually have more people who have been dying due to COVID-19 or COVID-19 related ailments 
because uh, and I, I have a an uncle in the insurance business and and they and he says that there is a problem in looking at the total number of deaths uh, per a given frame of time uh, per per given time frame say total number of deaths and they look at the axis as opposed to the average you know on average how many people can you expect to die of natural causes or other things within a certain year or within a certain given period of time and then they look at say uh, whether there is in an access to that average and right now we are at we've got uh, an enormous access of people uh, who have died and it's an even higher number than we have reported by the CDC for those who've died of COVID-19 and COVID-19 related ailments. So it could be, I'm not saying this for certain, but it could be that we might actually be undercounting the number of people who have actually died of COVID-19 uh, because perhaps they're looking at only the pre-existing condition, whether it was a heart ailment or asthma or something like that, and ignoring the fact that they also had the COVID-19 or they didn't even know that they had COVID-19 at the time of death. Okay, so that's my thing. You know, if you if you hear that from from uh, from people who say that we uh, that this has been an overblown pandemic that we've been overreacting, tell them no, no, they've misunderstood. We've actually been probably not reacting with the severity that we should have to the pandemic. Okay, but what do you guys think? What do you guys think? You tell me. You tell me about how you feel that we responded to the pandemic. Responded as the state of California or as a country. How do you think that we have done? And uh, how do you think we've done related to other countries? Let me know. Let me know in the chat and we'll discuss that. All right, without a little drink of water. Because what I'm really worried about right now is the fact that there is, um, that Trump has a new advisor on COVID-19, uh, one that he's um, he seems to be paying a lot of attention to. This advisor, his name escapes me right now, but he wants us to follow Sweden's example. And you can understand, if you're, if you're someone who wants everything to kind of like go back to normal in terms of businesses running and uh, just kind of like an open, an open flow of commerce, then Sweden seems to be very attractive because what Sweden did was, unlike every other country in Europe, uh, they did not have mandatory lockdown. They allowed, uh, say, a lot of businesses to stay open. You know, a lot of people could gather together in cafes and restaurants, they only uh, suggested, they only suggested, they did not mandate it, they just suggested keeping social distancing and wearing masks and so forth. They did not, did not say that we need to have that as a rule. And they also said that you cannot have a gathering larger than a certain amount of people. Okay, and they said, we're gonna do this to promote herd immunity. With herd immunity, we'll be able to deal with the second wave of the virus, because in all likelihood, it will come back. And according to Dr. Fauci, we are still in the first wave right now. So, uh, other, other, other countries are, are a little bit more prepared for the second one than we are. But right now, we are still just in the first wave. And so Sweden says, this is the policy that we're going to follow. It was different from every other country in Europe. And initially, it looked like things were fine. It looked like things were okay. Of course, things were okay for a few people. It always is to begin with. But then there was a very sharp rise in the deaths of elderly people in retirement communities, in hospitals, in care centers, and so on. Very, very sharp rise in the death of elderly people. And you can understand why. Say, when you, as you get older, your ability to fight, fight off uh, diseases, you fight off, and, and also kind of like, you know, to maintain a kind of like equilibrium 
in your system, if you're already dealing with some kind of uh, present condition, say it becomes much, much more difficult. So we started to get, uh, say, a, a sharp increase of deaths in Sweden. And also not just amongst uh, elderly people, say amongst the Somali population. Say the Somali population pretty much had to watch out for themselves during the COVID-19 pand uh, the, the, the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic in Sweden. Uh, because no one was looking out for them. So it's, no. R racism is, I'm sorry to say, not just an American problem. Uh, even, even in countries that don't appear to have the kind of racial uh, uh, inequalities that we have here in the United States, they're there, and they're there in Sweden. And so the, uh, the migrant population, the immigrant population over there was sort of just, just left, left unhelped in say densely populated areas and so for all of their efforts there was a sharp increase of deaths in there too and so while countries like italy were able to bring their numbers down say sweden kept steadily going up and right now right now sweden has about as much herd immunity as they did at the start of the pandemic it was an abysmal failure now, not everyone in Sweden thought, thought this was a great idea. Say, uh, as far as I can tell, the majority of the medical community in Sweden thought this was a horrendously foolish thing to do. Because, as, as they said, you know, how do we get herd immunity? We need a vaccine. A vaccine is the best way to guarantee herd immunity, and we don't have a vaccine yet. So this kind of expectation that things would just work out well for Sweden, while it was working out poorly for everyone else, blew up right in their face. And I, I hope, I hope that we're not going to try anything like that over here. We need to look at what happened to Sweden. We do not want that happening over here. We all, we already have enough problems here, folks. We don't need a Sweden level of problems over here. Okay, but let me know what you think. Let me know what you think in terms of how, how well or how unwell we've handled things here. In the United States, uh, say maybe California as opposed to other states, or just as a country as a whole. Let's see, you know, because I think there's a good deal of things that we can say about it and work in critical thinking issues into it. Okay, so what do you guys think? And also, if there's anyone new in the chat, please let me know that you're here. Let me know that you've uh, that you've shown up. Say hello. Tell us who you are. Tell us, say, how you've been doing. And, uh, well, I'll give you participation points before it. Zara says, we could be doing a lot better. I, I quite agree with you, Zara. Uh, do you have um, uh, do you have anything, do, any, any kind of, like, idea, say, of what we could have or what we should be doing right now as opposed to what we are doing? Because right now we are on the brink of opening up rest, uh, restaurants for about 20% capacity. Uh, you know, letting people back inside to, until it's just like 20% 20, 20 uh, full. And we're also going to be opening up the gyms again because by, by goodness, those, those gym rats, they need to go to their gyms. Oh, they do, they do not like not being able to go to their gyms. Oh, 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 oh it's, so, it's, so, it's so really, really hard for them. Well, to be fair, a lot of people do work out in gyms because it's, it's, a, big, it's a big stress reliever. Uh, they use it to uh, to keep their their emotional, their mental health levels uh, working okay. But a lot of them know. A lot of them say it is because they are just concerned about their appearance and little else. Okay. So what do you think about that? What do you think about, say, us opening up gyms, opening up restaurants again? Okay. So let me know what you think about that while I have some water. By the way, and this is very, very important, if you agree with how we've been handling the policy, say, you know, on a national level or at a domestic level, I'm not going to jump down your back on it. Uh, when I say domestic, I mean, I mean, uh, uh, California. I'm not going to, I'm not going to jump, I'm not going to jump on you or anything like that. Say, you know, uh, say this is not a class where you're going to be judged politically. Unless, of course, your politics are, you know, 
leaning towards fascism, or, you know, or, or a po politics where your solution is to get rid of or kill a certain number of the population. Say, then I am going to get you know, really on your case if that is the case. But you know, if you support Bernie, if you support Biden, if you support Trump. If you support, uh, what's another thing I can say? Well, those are most of your options these days. But I'm not going to give you a grade based on, say, who you support or whether you agree with me or not. Say, we're here to have constructive dialogue and learn how we can effectively talk to each other, explain our positions to each other, and maybe find ways where we can change our minds in a kind of way where we're not just shouting abuse at each other. Movie theaters are also going to reopen as of Tuesday. Zara just said that movie theaters are going to reopen on Tuesday. Ooh, I, I, don't, I don't know about that. Say so movie theaters, I know that um, some libraries, some local libraries are going to be reopening too. And here's what I don't like about that. Say so movie theaters, libraries, who goes to these things? A lot of old people. It, it's a it's a confined air conditioned environment. Say so that's that's terrible. Well, that's a good, if you, if you're the COVID virus, that's a very good condition to get spread around it. But it's a very bad thing for the people who go to these things, especially if you if you're older uh, or have some um, uh, some immune problems. Um, another problem too about opening up the libraries is it's where a lot of homeless people go. I have, a, I have a good deal of, of homeless friends, uh, a very, very good friend in particular, who practically live at, lived at libraries. And if they were to go back there, that would be pretty bad for the homeless population because it would bring in amongst each other. And also, you know, if you're homeless in, in Orange County, one of the things you have to do is just kind of like keep constantly moving on the buses because there are very few places where they'll let you be these days. And that is going to now uh, bring it more, uh, it's not going to spread it more amongst other people, not just homeless people. So it's a pretty, very big risk. And Zara says, I think it was a really bad idea for the fact that when masks were finally mandated, the OC sheriff announced that they would not be enforcing it. No, that, that is bad. Uh, that is bad because the thing is, then uh, it takes a good deal of the force away from it. And it sounds like if you are a person who refuses to wear the mask, it sounds like that you now have the sheriff's department on your side. And so you think, you know, they, they, it still would not work out this way. If it is a store's policy that you have to wear a mask to be in that store, you have to wear a mask to be in that store. But if the sheriff of the county says that we are not going to force the mandate, then it seems like that, oh, all I have to do is get uh, get the police down here and they'll make you stop making me wear a mask inside your store. So it, it causes all kinds of needless problems, needless problems. But here in Orange County, you probably have seen the videos of, of the people who go into the, uh, the city council meetings and the, uh, the county meetings and so forth and just rant and rave well maybe that's putting it no no they were ranting and raving ranting and raving about say why wearing masks are actually going to kill them about say how no one can breathe behind those masks why why it's an infringement on their god's given right to breathe air as if you can't breathe air behind a mask i'm sorry so you know like i said this is this is where you you're supposed to learn how to effectively uh, engage people without, say, calling them names and whatnot. But that's crazy. That's crazy. But here's the thing. How do we, how do we deal with that? How do we deal with a population of people that might just refuse to follow the rules because of whatever reason? Maybe, maybe some of them genuinely believe that it puts them at a severe health risk. I, I myself believe that for, for a lot of them, they just don't want to do it. That it's just an inconvenience for them, and maybe maybe they uh, they mix in a political motivation into it as well. But say for what what about for some some of them who might genuinely believe 
that it is a health risk for them to wear a mask. It would actually hurt them rather than help them to wear it. So what would you say to someone who takes that position? What would you say to that? And uh, we've got some uh, we got some very good input from Zara. Let's let's get someone else. Let's get someone else to 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 talk about this. We need we need uh, Zara has doing, been doing a heroic job, uh, say keeping the conversation going. Let's see if we can get someone else as well. We, let's see if we can get Enzo uh, in here or Jane or 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 um, uh, Seonghyun SA or any of these folks. Let's see if we can get them in here and talking about this because we, we got we got 20 minutes left we got 20 minutes left let's see if we can we can fill it with some uh some discussion about this you know, this will be not the last time that we bring it up by the way say this um say black lives matter the upcoming election say there are all kinds of really really important things going on right now that we need to talk about and some of you who may not have figured out already say what your position is on it this might be a good place to learn a few things okay it's good to check people's temperature when entering any restaurant or shops i think i think that could work i think that would um uh, uh, we might have to um, we might we might be dealing with people who say that's somehow invasive, just like when they would say wearing a mask is, is invasive. But I think if that was kind of like a, a requirement for you to get into Walmart or for you to get uh, into McDonald's, I think I think that would be okay. We could we could at least tell people uh, who are showing evident signs right right from the get go, you know, that you're running running a fever or something like that. That no, we're not letting you inside this place. I was at um, I was at Hopscotch Hopscotch uh, in downtown Fullerton, which is my favorite place to go in downtown Fullerton. I'm glad that it's still running. And I was there in their patio area, and there was a young man at the table across from me, and he began coughing, coughing hard. And not only was he coughing hard, he was taking his mouth down to cough. Like he he didn't cough into his mask. He took his mask off to cough into his hand, and the hand wasn't fully covering his face. It was just like right here. And I'm, I'm like, I'm like to the side over here. So I'm like, oh my goodness, is this, is this guy going to give give it to me? Am I, am I going to, am I going to get COVID-19 from this bozo over here? Oh, it was scary. It was scary. I, I went into a little bit of a panic. I, I, uh, I almost went back, uh, back home because of that. But I, cal I calmed down. I said, look, might not have been anything. Uh, oh, oh, and I did. I did warn the staff. I warned the staff. I said, uh, "F." I paid. I paid my bill and says, F -Y "FYI, this guy is, is coughing a good deal out here, and he's not doing it into his mask." So, uh, yeah, you got. You gotta. You gotta be. Wa you gotta watch out for these kind of things. You gotta watch out for people. Uh, people who make these kinds of decisions. Maybe. Maybe. And this is another thing when we talk about kind of like the psychology involved. Maybe they don't want to believe that there's anything wrong with them. Not wanting to believe something based on the fact that it is a, a uh, uh, as Al Gore would say, an inconvenient truth, or, or to put it another way, fucking scary, you know, can be a pretty big influence on our behavior. And we're going to be talking about kind of like uh, how um, uh, well, we can operate with kind of like a risk reward sort of thinking where we will actually say uh take the higher risk for something what even even when it seems like we would benefit even more from not taking it uh or or say um how this can change with time uh it's, it's going to be called the, the framing effect bias um i think uh, okay sara says i think people saying that that uh mass take with their freedom and that uh, that people who are Afraid the virus can just stay at home are taking away the freedom of, of elderly cancer patients. Yes, this is the thing that if you're talking about your freedoms as being paramount, 
the problem there is that, say, for you to just do whatever you want, you are now really affecting my ability and the ability of other people to do what they want as well. So when we say that we live in a free country, we obviously don't mean a country where you can do anything you want. You can't burn down orphanages. You can't, uh, you can't just go into someone's yard and, and uh, poop in their rose bushes. You can't just stab a man on the street whenever you want to. And these kind of things, more or less, we understand why even in a, country, a free country, we're not allowed to do these kinds of things. But we also have to understand that, say, when we're in a, when we're in a emergency, and we're in a health emergency right now, we also have to watch out when we're talking about, say, of exercising my freedoms at the expense of others. Just as Zara said, at the expense of people who uh, now are unable to enjoy their life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness here, thanks to your decision not to wear a mask or your decision to go out and cough all over people when you know that you're sick. So it's, it's, it's a kind of a, 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 a give and take that we have to keep in mind here. Let's say when we're talking about, say, freedom, is, and, and this, is, say, this, is, this is something why we have a constitution and a bill of rights. We're never just talking about, say, the freedom of that one person versus everyone else. It's a freedom that we all share together in this country and how a person's very selfish behavior can make it impossible, or at least improbable, for you to exercise that here if they if they behave a certain way. Okay. All right, and uh, 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 hold on just a second. Uh, yeah, Yu Jung says uh, uh, if they have conditions that they can't wear a mask then it should be more dangerous to them. You're absolutely right. So you're asking after yourself, why are you even going out if you have such a severe condition? If you, if you have a breathing problem, you shouldn't be even going out where there are a lot of people who can give this to you because you're at a greater risk of being amongst that 94% of people who die due to complications caused by COVID-19. Uh, so I think you're right, uh, Yung Jun, say that uh, when I said, so I think they should not go out in the first place unless it's necessary. Yeah, you know, people still need to go out and get food. People still need to go out and get supplies if no one is, is around to help them. But just to say, you know, I feel like getting a beer on a Friday night, just like I used to, then it is you're being unwise. If you're doing that because and you've got respiratory trouble, and and so on. Enzo said, "This is off topic, but I would love if there was if this was on Zoom because I would prefer to speak my ideas, positions instead of typing them." Thank you, Enzo. Thank you. I was hoping to get some input on how well this is working, and uh, I'm doing this on on YouTube first to see how well this works. For everyone, so don't worry, Enzo. It's not it's not on topic, off topic. Exactly why I'm doing this to get feedback from it. So, I did. I'm doing this on YouTube first because this is how I did it last semester when we transitioned over to doing remote education. I had to quickly learn how to do this, and I couldn't figure out how to do the Zoom. I said, "Screw it! I'll just do it on Facebook uh, on a, on a, what is this? YouTube? Just do it on YouTube." Okay. But we are going to try different things. And we are definitely going to try Zoom, Enzo, and see whether that works. And uh, we'll, see, we'll see what works best for, for everyone. We, we might end up going back to YouTube. But, Enzo, even if we decide that the majority of the students prefer doing it on YouTube than doing it on Zoom or some other platform, because we have... A, I have other options out there as well. You and I can still uh, have a Zoom conference, just just you and me. You and me and maybe some other people who prefer to do Zoom. You know, my job is to make sure that I can make 
myself available as best I can. So uh, if, not, if not this coming week, I will try to have this on Zoom, say, uh, two weeks from now. So I, I'll, I'll look and see if I can do it, say, this coming week. If I can't do it this coming week, we will try Zoom two weeks from now. Because like I said, we've we got to give it a try. Okay. All right. Zara says, I read that people who don't want to wear masks should be able to have an hour to grocery shop without it and forced, and it shows the lack of respect to those essential workers in those establishments. I, I uh, uh, yeah, that's the thing. That even if you say, okay, you don't want to wear a mask, fine, go, uh, we'll have a store open just for you at a certain amount of time during the day. Well, that is going to put the people who work at those places at a greater risk. That, uh, you know, there's a, re there, there's a reason why we have to kind of like have uh, almost kind of the kind of mentality that we would have in wartime, where we say that like, you're not supposed to, you're not supposed to say uh, waste rations. You're not supposed to waste gas. If you, uh, if you waste gas, you know, if you, if you ride, if you ride alone, you ride with Hitler is what they would have on posters in the United States when we were uh, uh, in World War II. When you ride alone, you ride with Hitler. So we had to, we had to really for, uh, force people into that kind of thinking that we have to be concernful in our behavior. We have to understand, say, how this is going to affect the lives of others. Say, you know, if you, if you carelessly talk about troop movements, that will directly affect those troops out there. So, you know, they have that, that poster of that, the finger pointing out from the waves that says, someone talked. You know, someone carelessly talk about, say, troop deployments and whatnot, and, and this was the consequence for it. So, you know, we need to have a, a kind of mentality like that. We have to think, stop thinking of just it being about ourselves, but how our actions are affecting the lives of other people. Okay. Yeah. Ah, bon oui. It is Johnny from France. Hello, Johnny. Say, uh, comment allez-vous? Hello to you. Are you um, are you one of my students, Johnny? Are you are you in this class? Are you in um, uh, philosophy one one seventy two critical thinking and writing? No, de rien. So I know I know I have this open uh, as an open thing for people to come into. I'm going to try to find a way where I can have it private for just the people in my class. So if you're not in my class, Johnny, I'm not going to I'm not going to eject you, but I do hope you'll you'll be uh, uh, you'll be uh, polite to the people in the chat right now. Because we're uh, this is a class discussion, and right now we're talking about the COVID pandemic. Do you love history books, Johnny? That's delightful. Okay. That's I have I have a number of history books myself. I'm also a fan of history. Okay. All right. Does anyone else? Anyone else want to talk about the pandemic? If not, we might call it a day right now. Uh, going back again to what you said, Enzo. I will. Uh, I will be doing this on Zoom in the very near future, if not this week, then the coming week. And we'll see if Zoom works. And if the Zoom doesn't work for the most class, you and I can still do it on Zoom with other people who uh, prefer Zoom. So I think we'll, we'll call a day here. And uh, I'll have the video lectures. The video lectures I was supposed to have up on, uh, on Friday, I'll have later today. Okay, hold on. Let's see here. Da, 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 da. Uh, all right. Here we go. Okay. All right. So have a very good day, all. Have a wonderful Saturday. And take care of yourselves. All right. Bye-bye.